Hi, Carl here for Pro VTV, and welcome to the final part of our ongoing series of tests on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. So this one, we're gonna be taking a look at the camera, specifically in terms of image quality, compared to other cameras that are a bit higher end, other video cameras or cinema cameras. Because this is a bit of a strange camera really, despite its very low price point, it does seem to fit in both camps. So in the last video, we compared it to small mirrorless cameras, things that, that are a bit closer to its price range and size, things like the GH5, the A7 line, um, Canon's EOS R, cameras like that. In this video, what we're gonna do is see how this hand, um, holds up against far bigger, far more expensive cameras. We're not going crazy high end here. We're looking at sort of the, the entry level, if you like, professional video cinema camera from each of the manufacturers. So things like the FS5 from Sony, the EVA 1 from Panasonic, Canon C200, the Kinefinity Terra 4K, cameras like that, and seeing how well the image quality of this will compare to those cameras. Now, bear in mind here, the image quality is only one small part of the overall picture. If this does better or worse than some of those other cameras, that's only one small part of what you need to consider when you're trying to choose one of these cameras to be your tool. Because after all, these are tools. They need to work for us. They need to be professional tools which will go out there and we can earn our living from them. And image quality is one small part of what means that a camera is gonna be capable of doing that for each individual person because everyone's needs are different. But I'm really excited to see just how well this camera does against those other big ones. So let's not waste any time and let's get stuck in. So first up, we've got the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Now for this test, what we did is we did the same shot with each of the cameras with the same settings and the same subtle grade applied to each one. Now for each of these cameras, you can make it look far better than I've made them look here by tailoring your post-production workflow and your settings on, on the shoot day to the specific strengths and weaknesses of each camera. You can make each one look far better than it does here. What this is a test of is to see straight out of camera with minimal work or post-production, and if you're not used to using each camera maybe even, what the results are gonna look like, what the differences between each of them are gonna be. So looking at the Blackmagic straight away, I think this just looks great. It can maybe be a little bit sharper, but it's a very clean image. The colors look brilliant, really rich, really vibrant. Her skin tone is beautiful. I think this is a really nice looking image. And as we swap over here to, this, to the RAW, to the Cinema DNG, it stays pretty much the same in this shot. I mean, this is an ideal situation shot. We don't need the extra capability of RAW here. The colors look pretty much the same. The detail looks pretty much the same. I think you can easily swap between ProRes and RAW without noticing too much of a difference just for when you want to swap over to RAW to get the extra benefits of it. So this is the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. So this is Blackmagic's larger version, if you like, of the pocket camera. It's got a bigger sensor, it's got a higher resolution sensor, but a slightly older sensor. So it'll be interesting to see what the differences are between them. The first things that jump out to me here is mainly the green. I mean, overall, it's got a slightly colder look, but particularly in the green, it seems to be slightly more saturated and maybe a bit of a, a faker green color, a bit more plasticky than there was on the pocket. I'm not as keen on how this camera is handling the greens. All the other cameras look fantastic, but if you look at the, the green patches on the color chart, the plant, the table behind her, they seem a little bit more plasticky maybe. But overall, I think this is a fantastic looking image, particularly the sharpness. It's a very, very detailed 4.6K resolution file that you get from the Ursa Mini Pro. And I don't mean sharp. If you look at her hair, there aren't any nasty artifacts or anything like that. It's a very, very detailed image. I think it looks absolutely fantastic. And the skin tones look brilliant. I've always really liked the look of the Ursa Mini Pro when it's taken in an ideal situation like this. So as we move on to the Sony FS5 Mark II, I think this isn't handling color anywhere near as well. It looks a little bit noisier and it definitely doesn't look anywhere near as sharp or detailed. I mean, overall image quality has never been a strength of the Sony FS5 Mark II. Um, it, that camera strengths are definitely its ergonomics, the practicality of it. Overall image quality, like in a test like this, I just don't think it holds up against some of the other cameras. 
Um, you can make this look far better, particularly in terms of things like color, if you grade for it and if you use their lookup tables, things like that. But here, lined up against the other cameras with the same post-production and the same settings applied to it, I think it just doesn't look anywhere near as good, unfortunately. Now this is the Kinefinity Terra 4K, which is a very interesting camera because their Kinefinity are relatively new to the market. Apart from maybe Blackmagic, all these other camera manufacturers have been making cameras for a long time, whereas Kinefinity and Blackmagic haven't. And in some ways they have very similar approaches, but I think this looks like a fantastic image. It's very detailed. It's not quite as detailed as the, um, as the 4.6K Ursa Mini Pro, but it's just as detailed as the Blackmagic Pocket. I think overall the color looks brilliant. I really like the skin tones. Maybe there's a slight yellowy tone in the reds, on this camera, particularly if you look at the bike, it, it renders it a little bit yellower than some of the others, but that's not necessarily unpleasant, but it's not accurate. It's not the same color as the bike is here in real life, but you could grade that so that it looks better and it looks more accurate like this, but straight out of camera, it definitely has that color cast. But overall, it's a very clean image. I think the skin tones look brilliant. I really like the image from the Kinefinity. So this is the Panasonic EVA 1. Overall, I think the image looks good. It's perhaps got a, quite a strong green tint to it, though. I've always found this with the Panasonic EVA 1. When you are using their lookup tables, or you're using an ACES workflow with the ACES designed IDT for this camera, this gets cleaned up straight away. It's not an issue whatsoever. But when you're taking the file straight from the camera against other cameras like this, and you're just applying simple um, color correction, the same as you're applying to everything else. It definitely has this green tint, which you can see across the whole image, but that does disappear when you're using the proper workflow for the camera. And I think everything else about the image looks very good. It looks very detailed. The contrast looks great. The detail looks lovely. I think this is a lovely camera in terms of image, but you need to use the right workflow for it. Now this is the Canon C200. We did the C200 in both MP4 and in RAW. Now this is the only camera here that I did do that with that I swapped it over to RAW, apart from on this test with the Blackmagic. And the reason that I did that is because, unlike the Blackmagic where the ProRes and the RAW are actually pretty similar in a lot of regards, on the C200 it's pretty much like having two complete different cameras in one body. And so I really wanted to see the differences between the MP4 and the RAW because the MP4, to be honest, is a little bit underpowered compared to a lot of the other cameras here. And the RAW is a little bit overpowered compared to all the other cameras here. So that is interesting to see. But looking here at the C200 MP4, I'm really pleased with the image. I really do like the image out of the C200. I mean, yes, the skin tones are a little bit more saturated, particularly here in the MP4, but they're accurate and they look good. I mean, the color and the sharpness and the noise overall just looks very clean. The one thing with the MP4 though, um, it's actually to do with the color science of the camera and the color space of the camera. It doesn't l let you get into the full cinema gamut. You have to be in the Rec. 709 gamut. And I do find red sometimes go a little bit magenta on, in the MP4 and the C200. And you can see that a little bit on the bike and a little bit in the color patches. And as we move across to the raw, you see what I mean. The bike has now pretty much changed color. It looks a much more vivid, accurate red. And all the colors overall are a little bit desaturated actually compared to it, particularly her skin, which looks much more in line with perhaps some of the other cameras now. It, that little bit of that Canon default look has gone, if you like. I mean, obviously you can claw it back by just simply raising the saturation, but this is a much more of a cinematic feel straight away. There's a lot more information in the shadows as well. And particularly the detail really springs out. I think the C200 has got a fantastically detailed picture in RAW. So this is the split screen between the Blackmagic RAW and the ProRes on the pocket camera. And as you can see, I mean, there's not really much difference at all in a test like this. This is the Kinefinity at the top, the Sony in the middle, and then the pocket in ProRes down at the bottom. Now the Sony instantly jumps out as being not quite as good. The contrast is not as good. It's noisier. The color profiles isn't there quite as much as in the other cameras. And the difference between the Blackmagic and the Terra is really interesting to me. I think I prefer the skin tones of the Terra. They look a little bit more muted, a little bit desaturated, but I think that's actually a very pleasant look compared to the Blackmagic. Um, it's certainly a very different um, 
mentality to something like the Canon cameras, which have got a very saturated skin tone, very accurate, but very saturated. Whereas the Terra goes accurate and desaturated, which I like, because you can always pump that saturation in later. But look at the difference in the bike. The Blackmagic, I think, is more accurate here. The Terra definitely renders it that little bit yellowy. But overall, I think they're very, very close in terms of image, these two cameras. Now, this is the C200, both the MP4 and the RAW compared to the Blackmagic. And instantly, straight away, you notice that more saturated skin tones. It's very accurate, but very saturated. The bike looks very accurate and very colorful. It looks pretty much the same, to be honest, as it does in the Blackmagic here in this test. And overall, I think the noise floors may be slightly lower on the C200 than it is on the Blackmagic, but I'm very happy with all three of the images here. I think these look fantastic. And again here, I think these look fantastic. This is the Blackmagic's lineups. This is the RAW on the Blackmagic, the ProRes on the Blackmagic, and the ProRes out of the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. And I think they look brilliant. I mean, again, the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro is a little bit colder, perhaps. You can see it's a diff slightly different sensor. I think people could very happily use the Pocket as a B camera and the Ursa Mini Pro as a A camera, for example, and cut between them very happily. So in case you didn't catch our previous videos, what we're doing with this over and under exposure test is we're having the same settings on every single camera and we've got an averagely exposed shot at zero stops and then we've given that a very, very slight and subtle grade to just to delog the file effectively. Then we've gone one stop, two stops and three stops overexposed and we've tried to grade those overexposed log files back down to match the original zero stops file. And then we've got minus one, minus two, minus three stops underexposed and tried to grade, that, grade those back up to match the original one. Now what this can tell us is it can tell us the amount of information that's in the highlights and the amount of information in the shadows and what happens to those areas when they go up and when they go down. Now, bear in mind that cameras with dual native ISOs do get a little bit skewed in this particular test because I have had to use the ISO to get higher in order to um, get the overexposed shots. And particularly in the case of the Blackmagic Pocket, we found that actually really skewed some of the results here um, and made it look worse than the camera actually is. We did a whole video going much more in depth on this camera to try and figure out what went on there, specifically with the dual native ISO and looking at will RAW help it and all that sort of things. So if you haven't watched that video yet, make sure you go and watch that because it really does go much more in detail on the pocket specifically. And that we've got a link to that video with a card up here and down in the comment section down below in the description of this video. You can also maybe safely assume that other cameras in this test with dual native ISOs like the Terra 4K and the Evil One would have had similar issues. Unfortunately, we're not able to show the Evil One. We did lose the data, unfortunately, due to a corrupt SD card. And so we have lost that data, which is a real shame. I would have liked to put it up against these other cameras, but unfortunately we didn't have time to redo the entire tests because of it. So let's get started straight away. So the Pocket Cinema Camera, this is the exact same shots as we saw in the previous tests, whereas plus one, plus two look fantastic, but then plus three has quite severely clipped. Now, if you went back and watched that previous video, we know that this is because of the ISO 1600. It didn't do this when it was at native ISOs, anywhere near as much, and you can recover a lot of this detail in RAW. But here, in this test, with ProRes, with these settings, it definitely, did um, sharply clip here, and I think this is very useful to know with this camera, to know how best to get the best results from it. In terms of underexposure, I was actually very impressed with the Blackmagic. It does get noisy at minus two stops, and at minus three it is very noisy. There is a little bit of pattern noise in there, but nothing too much. Some horizontal lines a little bit there. But overall, I think this will clean up quite nicely. In Resolve, it will leave you with a soft image. It's definitely not ideal, but it looks all right. This is the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K in ProRes HQ. And actually, this did remarkably well in overexposure. You can see here, plus one and plus two stops look just as good as plus zero stops. They look fantastic. And then plus three stops. I mean, 
I can't see any clipping. I can't see any difference between the plus two stops and the plus three stops. I mean, say what you want about the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, but that camera has some fantastic dynamic range and overexposure capabilities. It looks really good here. Underexposure though, it does fall apart a little bit. Minus two looks okay, but minus three is noisy. But more importantly, you can see that blue shift. You can see it a little bit in the minus two, but in the minus three, it's very obvious there's a blue shift across the entire image, which is gonna be quite hard to get rid of in post. It is gonna skew your colors for the entire shot. Now the Sony FS5 Mark II is interesting. You see those problems with colors that we saw on the previous test, skin tones, things like that, but actually it handles overexposure remarkably well. Notice also that we had to go up to ISO 2000 for these tests because of S-Log2 and the way that that works. And so for noise levels and things like this, this isn't very fair to directly compare it, but actually maybe saying that in some ways it is directly fair because it forces you to use ISO 2000. But actually the noise levels look pretty good and the overexposed areas in that plus three stops, they're recovered nicely. I think the Sony cameras do really well in overexposure and a lot of that is because of the gamma curve of S-Log2. Although it's difficult to use for color, the dynamic range on S-Log is brilliant. At minus three stops, we start to see some of the limitations of the Sony FS5 though. This is partly because of its compressed format and partly because of the sensor and partly because the S-Log2 is a very aggressive log curve. The same th reason that made it do so well in the overexposed areas is what's causing it problems here in the underexposed areas. It's lifting the shadows up way too much and you're seeing all of this awful blockiness in the shadows and a huge amount of color noise. Minus three is definitely not usable under any circumstances here, I don't think. Minus two looks noisy. It's about as bad as minus three on most of the other cameras. And minus one looks about as bad as minus two. This is definitely a camera you want to overexpose, not underexpose. Now this is the Kin Affinity. So it would be interesting to do a more detailed tests here to see whether the dual native ISO was causing the same problems here as it was with the Black Magic. Although I wouldn't be surprised if this did have slightly less dynamic range than the Black Magic, but what we're seeing here is we are seeing some clipping areas in the plus three stops. It's nothing too bad and it definitely does an awful lot better than some of the cameras we saw in the mirrorless comparison. But plus two looks fantastic and plus three, there is some clipping, but it looks pretty good. Also, this is ProRes on the camera. There is Cinema DNG on this camera, and so it'd be interesting to see if that performed better. But one thing to notice is that the color performance is very consistent as we're overexposing here. There's no problems in her skin tones there. Even in the overexposed areas, it's not bringing in any unwanted color casts, which is quite nice to see. On underexposure, Minus two is noisy, it's definitely noisy, and there is some colored noise there. It's finer blocks than we saw on some of the other cameras, but it is there. And at minus three, we are getting some horizontal lines there, which is a little bit of a shame, but normally we find that the Kinfinity cameras are quite easy to clean up in post. They're not doing any noise reduction in camera, which I think is the reason that the minus two and the minus one stops look like they are but I think minus three is probably pushing these cameras a little bit too far. I would probably stay away from minus three. So this is the MP4 on the C200. And in terms of overexposure, I think for a very compressed MP4 file, this does really quite well. You can see all that information on the table is held. There is some clipping in the very high bright bits there, but it looks very good. There's no color cast as we go up into the overexposed areas and have to retrieve those back. I think this looks brilliant in terms of overexposure. In terms of underexposure though, this is by far the worst out of all the cameras we've looked at here. I think even worse than the FS5 Mark II in terms of underexposure. And the reason that I say that on minus three stops, look at that huge amount of color information, color blocking, big green and magenta blocks. Now this is probably because of the eight bit, but also because of the compressed MP4 format it's just not as strong a codec as the XAVCL is in the FS5, even though both are 8-bit. 
And it's a bit frustrating because actually the color looks pretty good. The skin tones look good. There's no wash over the entire image. It's just that when you get those big compression artifacts, they go very strange colors, big green chunks, big green magenta chunks. And they are very, very noticeable and very, very obvious. Minus three is frustratingly close, but definitely not usable. Minus two, you're starting to get it a little bit, but I think could be usable. Minus one looks fine, actually. It's very, very clean. When we swap over to raw, it's a different story. The overexposure here looks brilliant. All the information is held there in the table. All the colors look fantastic. There's nothing bad to say here about the C200 RAW in terms of overexposure. I think this looks fantastic and just as good as any of the other cameras we've seen here. When it comes to underexposure, the C200 isn't doing any noise reduction in camera and that is showing. On the minus two and the minus three, you can see some noise, but I think everything here would be quite easily cleaned up in something like DaVinci Resolve. You are getting some green cast in the noise and some color noise, but I think it should be fairly easy to clean up. I think actually the RAW did very well in terms of underexposure. So moving on to the split screens, straight away here we've got the overexposure comparisons. We've got the Blackmagic down at the bottom, you can see that clipping. We've got the Terra 4K and the C200's MP4. Now again I'm really surprised by just how well the C200's MP4 does here. There is some clipping on the table, but not too much at all. It looks pretty good. The Terra 4K has definitely clipped. It would be interesting to see if this suffers from some of the same problems as the Blackmagic because of the dual native ISO, but it's definitely clipped nowhere near as much as the Blackmagic did down here. So that is interesting to see. Now these are the cameras that I think did very well. So again, we've got the Blackmagic at the bottom just for reference, but the two at the top is the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K and the C200's RAW. Now, I think the C200 has clipped that little bit more than the Ursa Mini Pro. If you look at the extreme right-hand side of the table on the right of the car, you can see slightly more clipping on the C200's RAW than on the Ursa Mini Pro. But overall, I think both look absolutely fantastic here. I would give the edge ever so slightly to the Black Magic there, just because it seems to have slightly more dynamic range in those highlights but the RAW from the C200 looks fantastic. So this is the Ursa Mini Pro against the FS5 Mark II. And again, the FS5 did very well in the overexposure. You see all the problems with color that we've already talked about. The skin tone's definitely not as nice, but if you look at the table, I think this does just as well. I think both cameras here have maintained all the information on the table. There's nothing clipped there on either of them, which is remarkably good for the FS5 Mark II considering it's an 8-bit compressed internal recording. So let's move on to underexposure. This is minus three stops on some of the cameras. So we've got the Blackmagic 4K in ProRes down at the bottom. We've then got the C200's MP4 and the Terra 4K. So both the Terra and the C200 had some problems here. I would give the win to the Terra, even though you can see some horizontal linings there and there is a lot of noise. I have found that that noise can be cleaned up pretty well in post. You do still get some of the horizontal banding, but the noise can actually be cleaned up. Whereas there's no way you're ever going to be able to clean up that C200. The huge chunks of 8-bit nastiness and blockiness particularly if you look at the extreme left and at the wall behind the left of her head, it's just fallen apart. The, it's all gone to mush a little bit and there's big, large chunks of green. The Black Magic, on the other hand, I think looks really quite good. I think it's got a lot of the problems of the Terror, but I think it is doing more noise reduction in camera than the Terror is. And I think that's a lot of the reason that is masking some of that. The reason I think that is because I think it doesn't look quite as detailed, and particularly on the wall behind, you can maybe see some of the mushiness. You can still see some of the color information, but the noise is a lot less defined and a little bit mushier, which makes me think that the Black Magic is still doing some noise reduction in there, whereas the Kinefinity isn't doing anything whatsoever. So I think with noise reduction added in post, you're gonna be able to make the Terror look better than the Black Magic there. So, although in this test the Black Magic looks better, I think I am going to give the win to the Terror, but that is a very close call. Now the FS5 Mark II and the Ursa Mini Pro both had big problems here. 
I think the OSM Mini Pro does look better just because there isn't that blockiness because it's a higher bit depth codec. The FS5 has fallen apart and it has got very, very noisy. Both have got quite strong color tints. The FS5 has gone way towards magenta and the OSM Mini Pro has gone way towards the blue. I think the Blackmagic Pocket looks better than both cameras here in terms of underexposure, which is quite interesting. It does, that more modern sensor in the pocket does beat the sensor in the Ursa Mini Pro. Bringing in the raw at the top from the C200, and I think this wins hands down above any of the others. It's still got problems. None of these cameras look good at minus three stops. We really are pushing the cameras to their limits here. And there is some slight color noise, some greenness in the C200, but I think that is very easily gonna be cleaned up. There's a lot less noise reduction problems happening than in the Black Magic, and it, none of the color cast that is in the Ursa Mini Pro. And so I think with some noise reduction added in post, that C200 is actually gonna look pretty usable, which for minus three stops is really quite impressive. So this is the high ISO test. What I wanted to do here is see how each of the cameras handles going to those undesirable ISOs. Specifically, ISO 6400 is what I chose here for this test. I think that is a really useful ISO for high ISO tests, just because it is high and you don't go up to ISO 6400 unless you really need to, but also it's not unrealistically high. It is one that a lot of people, myself included, do use a lot of the time when you need to. And so I think it is a realistic ISO that people are actually gonna be using all of these cameras at. So first up, we've got the Blackmagic pocket camera as always. And I think this looks fantastic. There's definitely some noise, nothing that couldn't be cleaned up in post. The colors look great, her skin tones look great. I'm so pleased with how well the pocket camera is doing in um, low light, specifically, how much of an improvement this is over Blackmagic's previous cameras, which we're gonna see in this test when I go over to the Ursa Mini Pro. But I think the Blackmagic Pocket looks fantastic here. Now this is what I was talking about with the Ursa Mini Pro. So for those that don't know, the Ursa Mini Pro can only go up to a maximum of 1,600 ISO. And even then it's starting to get a little bit noisy. It's not ideal really with that camera. You wanna be keeping it down at 400 or 800. And so what I've done here is I've obviously haven't been able to get it up to 6,400 to compare, but I wanted to include it in here because I'm saying that the pocket is so much better than Blackmagic's previous cameras. And I wanted to illustrate that point. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the fair comparison. We're looking at the T2.8, which is what I used on all the other cameras with the max ISO I could get with the Ursa Mini Pro. And so that is, um, 1,600, and then it's graded back up to try and match the exposure of the other shots. And as you can see, this doesn't look good. I mean, for a start, the entire image has gone very, very cold with a strong magenta tint. But if anything more importantly than that, the noise looks awful. We've got these very strong vertical lines across the entire image. And that's not not only noticeable but in the background, it's also noticeable on her face. If you look at the darker side of her nose and on the dark side of her face there by her earbuds, you can just see these huge, strong purple and blue lines going up her face, which is really unpleasant. This is not usable in, by any stretch of the imagination. Now, because I had a T1.5 lens on, what I did here is I cheated a little bit. I opened that lens up to T1.5 to see how good in this environment could we make the Ursa Mini Pro look. Let's give it a little bit of a fighting chance and let a little bit more light into the sensor. So this is again ISO 1600, but with T1.5 rather than T2.8, so you're getting an extra whole stop of light. And it's looking way better, but it's still not good. I mean, that color cast has gone, which is good, but we've still got those very strong vertical lines. They are less noticeable, but you can still see them, particularly in the background, but I can still see them here on her face. I don't know if this is gonna show up as well on YouTube, but particularly in the shadow areas of her forehead next to her hair there, I'm seeing very strong lines, exactly the same as I did in the previous shot. 
So there's definitely some problems with using the Ursa Mini Pro here in low light. And this is why I'm so pleased that the pocket camera does so well. This is the Kinefinity Terra 4K. And again, I think this looks fantastic. It is noisier than the Blackmagic, and I think that's because, although the noise reduction is very subtle in the pocket, Blackmagic pocket camera, I think it is there, whereas I don't think the Kinefinities do any form of noise reduction, and that is shown here. But I think the colors look fantastic. If, if anything, the colors look a little bit better than the Blackmagic. The Blackmagic goes a little bit stronger red when it gets up to these high ISOs, whereas I think the Terra maintains the color across the board. So looking at the EVA 1, we noticed straight away that green tint that was there in the previous tests. And it is worth reminding again that that can be cleaned up a lot by using either an ACES workflow or one of the lookup tables designed by Panasonic for the camera. But this is a more noticeable green tint than there was in the original test. So that does seem that it, that tint does get more noticeable when you go up to the higher ISOs. But it is very obvious here and the noise levels aren't that great either, to be honest with you. They're quite high, there's a lot of noise going on here, and there is some horizontal banding. Now, I didn't have noise reduction turned on in camera, but so maybe that or cleaning up in Resolve would help the situation here, but straight out of camera, this isn't looking quite as good as some of the other cameras. Now, the FS5 Mark II actually looks quite clean, but when you do notice the noise, it is definite colored noise and there is large blocks of it. And also the skin tones don't look quite as good. I mean, since we've just looked at the EVA, they, they look all right because the EVA has such a strong green tint to it. But if we go on to the next, when we go on to the next one, you'll notice that it looks significantly less green than this FS5 does. There is definitely a green tint in her skin there. And I think overall the image just looks duller and not quite as vibrant as some of the others. So this is the MP4 on the C200 and the skin tones look fantastic. There's perhaps a little bit of a magenta -y red tone in the background, but the noise levels look pretty under control. They are there and there is some colored noise, but it's not crazy bad. And the quality of the image I think looks much better than some of the other ones. It, it's a vibrant image, it's a perfectly usable image. There's no nasty horizontal bandings, but there is some slightly blocky noise from some compression there in the shadows. The RAW, on the other hand, looks quite significantly different to the MP4. The skin tone looks different. Again, there's perhaps more green in it than in the MP4. That magenta tint has gone, but I think the skin looks fantastic. The background actually looks very accurate to what it was before. And although there's high levels of noise, I think this is all something that could be very easily cleaned up. We're seeing the same sort of results here with the C200 RAW than we were seeing with the underexposure test in the previous bunch of tests. Yes, there's noise, but I think this is very easy to clean up in post. And I think once you do that, it's gonna look absolutely fantastic. So looking at the split screens, we've got the Pocket from Blackmagic at the bottom, we've got the Ursa Mini Pro on the top and the C200's MP4 in the middle. And I think you can discount the Ursa Mini Pro straight away. I mean, it just looks nowhere near as good as all the other cameras here. Both the Pocket and the C200 look really quite good. Um, C200 is definitely contrastier, it looks more vibrant, but you could make the Blackmagic look like that in post if you wanted to. If we look at the noise levels, they're fairly comparable, to be honest. I think they perform about the same here, which is quite impressive considering the C200 is using a compressed 8-bit codec rather than the ProRes 10-bit on the Blackmagic. The Blackmagic is looking good, but I'd expect it to be looking good. The C200 is looking good, and I'm quite surprised by how well the MP4 is holding up there. Both look very usable to me. The FS5, shows up its green tint here against the other cameras, but also the noise level, just overall the image is looking a bit muddier. You can't see anywhere near as much into the shadows in the background. And where you can see the noise, it looks quite unpleasant and blocky. The Terra 4K and the Black Magic is again interesting. The Terra 4K seems brighter, it seems more vivid and vibrant. It seems almost like there was more light coming in. They, they were set on exactly the same exposure here. No, the light had levels hadn't changed at all between the two camera setups. And the noise, although there is more noise, I think it would be easier to clean up in post. And I think once you do that, you're gonna end up with this better looking image than you do with the Blackmagic. 
So although both cameras perform very, very well here, I do think I'm going to give the edge slightly to the Terra 4K over the Blackmagic Pocket, but at the end of the day, it's a bit trivial. Both look fantastic. And this is, again, just to highlight, once again, the amazing improvement that Blackmagic have made with the Pocket over their previous generation of cameras. The Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, although it is a fantastic camera overall, really does not do well here at um, low light at all. You just can't use that camera in this sort of an environment. So that was the last of our tests on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. I hope you've been enjoying our coverage. This camera has brought a lot of attention. There's been so much engagement. Thank you so much to everyone that's been subscribing to the channel and liking the videos and commenting down below. It's really great to see so many of you being so active and so interested in this camera. We make videos like this for pretty much every camera that's out there. We've got access to all of them here. So if you want to see anything on any other camera that is released in the future, all that's already been released, please do let me know. And if you've got any further questions about the Blackmagic specifically, let me know down in the comment section down below. If you want to buy one for yourself, the links are in the description or any of the other cameras we've looked at here in today's test. I'll link to all of them down in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.